Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for Monday, June the 15th for British Columbia. We acknowledge we're on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow there will be a COVID-19 briefing. It'll be from the Vancouver uh, Cabinet offices tomorrow at 3 o'clock. On Wednesday uh, there'll be a written statement um, with case numbers and other pertinent information. And on Thursday, there will be another live briefing again at the Vancouver Cabinet offices. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. So for today, um, we are reporting on three periods of our COVID-19 cases. Uh, so from Friday to Saturday, we had 14 people who tested positive for COVID-19 in the province. Saturday to Sunday, we had an additional 16 people test positive. And from Sunday to today, an additional six cases. So that uh, brings our total um, to 36 new cases um, and our overall total to 2,745 people with COVID-19 in British Columbia. And that includes 934 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,420 in the Fraser Health Region, 130 people in Vancouver Island Health Region, 195 people in the Interior Health Region, and 65 people in Northern Health. We have uh, no new healthcare outbreaks to report over the weekend. Um, Although, uh, on a positive note, the South Granville Park Lodge uh, outbreak at long-term care home has been declared over um, as of today. So that leaves us with four active outbreaks in our health care system, um, all of them in long-term care. And we've had uh, an increase of nine resident cases and uh, an increase of 10 cases, uh, giving us uh, 353 residents and 220 staff who have been affected in our health care system. We have no additional community outbreaks either, and uh, the Curl Lake outbreak um, in Alberta has been officially declared over. We were notified by Alberta Health this morning that that one, uh, they've had no new cases for two, incuba in a two incubation periods, so that's good news. Uh, we'll continue to monitor with them. Um, and we continue to monitor and support in the other community facilities that have had outbreaks here in BC. So that leaves us with 182 active cases, of whom 13 are in hospital and four are people are in critical care or ICU. Additionally, we've had no new deaths over the past uh, four days since Friday, so um, also very good news. Um, and we now have 2,395 people who have fully recovered here in British Columbia. So in uh, many parts of our province uh, where we have not had um, new cases in some time, it may feel almost like back to normal. And I know many people have connected with friends they haven't seen for a while, are getting back to work and school and making plans for the summer. Um, and next week, the BC Ledge will be back in session. It is easy sometimes when we are in this place that we're in to lose sight of the fact that this pandemic is far from over. There continues to be no effective treatment and the virus will continue in our communities for many months to come. Part of the reason that we have so few cases in the province is because we have been doing our part to ensure that we're taking those measures to um, s keep this virus from spreading quickly. We have put an immense effort into staying safe across the province. And despite this, we know that several thousands of people have experienced illness, including some severe illness, and many families have lost loved ones. As we look ahead, our objective is to keep the cases low, to minimize the impact on our communities so that we can start getting back to other parts of our life. We also need very actively to contain any clusters rapidly, and that's the work of us in public health, making sure that every person is followed up on, that we track every person they've been in contact with, that we find people early. And part of that is making sure that anybody who has symptoms that could be COVID-19 needs to be tested and tested rapidly. 
To do this, we are opening what is safe to open. And we've been talking about that over the last few weeks and keeping closed those things that we know are lead to rapid spread and sometimes very dramatic outbreaks. We are slowly easing restrictions that are safe to lessen and keeping measures in place to contain further spread. We know as more of us go to work, go to school, um, gather, um, the risk increases that someone will inadvertently bring the virus into our group. And we have seen that happen. We have seen that happen in other countries around the world. And we look at South Korea and Singapore, Washington state, many of the US states that are starting to see a resurgence. We also know that it's happened here in BC where we've had clusters where people have gathered and somebody has inadvertently spread it to many of their close contacts and family members. We've had clusters very recently in a fast food restaurant. And we need to make sure that those measures that we have um, uh, we, that we know will work to prevent this transmission, both from us in a social event, but also at work. So we need to continue to have our distances at work to make sure that as employees, we're not gathering um, and having the potential for spread. We know that we've seen it in staff in, in places like food processing plants, and we've taken measures to, to up the infection control precautions in those settings. We know, of course, that we've seen it with devastating effect and continue to see it in our long-term care homes. The recent outbreaks have been caught early for the most part, but the impact is still significant. And when left unchecked, even a small cluster can quickly surge and it can spread those sparks in our communities and that we do not want that spark to grow into a fire again. The tools that we have are ones that we know now rapid testing for anyone with symptoms so we can quickly contain every single case in the province and stop outbreaks quickly. Giving everyone the space to stay safe, whether it's at home, at work, with friends, or even in the community. Always following the rules and using the layers that we have in place for safe social interactions. So number one, of course, is making sure we never go out and go around others if we're feeling unwell ourselves. We need to make sure that we wash our hands regularly, that we cover our cough, that we keep our safe distances, keep our germs to ourselves. It can sometimes be easier to navigate the path ahead when the answers are clear. And we are learning more and more about what things are clear. Some of the things that we do know is that gatherings of large numbers of people, even when distances are meant to be uh, respected can lead to very rapidly growing outbreaks and often they are the people that we care about most. So no gatherings over 50 people is going to stay with us and that only with distancing, only with ensuring that we have those fewer faces, larger spaces. Staying home if you are ill will continue to stay with us throughout this um, pandemic and that means for many months to come the hand washing that we know is so important. Those safe distances that we know are so important are going to stay with us. But we do know there are many things we can do. We can go outside, we can go for a walk, we can meet with our small bubble and have our contacts. We can go to restaurants when they have a plan to keep us all safe. And here in BC, there are many activities in phase two and as we're transitioning to phase three, that are proceed with caution. And those will become clearer as we move forward. There's a lot we can do, but we have to be careful. We can go back to work with physical distancing, with increased hand hygiene, with increased cleaning of our environments. We can see a small number of our friends, making sure that we're cautious. We can travel in a limited way in BC, but then we need to follow our safe travel rules that we talked about small numbers, calling ahead to see what's open, bringing what you need so you don't put a burden on that community that you're going to, and of course staying home if anyone in your group is unwell. We can and must continue to protect our families, our loved ones, and our communities across the province. And to do this, we need to continue to do this together, to stand together by standing apart as we move forward. And we must also, of course, continue to be kind, to be calm with each other, and to be safe.
Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, obviously today we're uh, very pleased that uh, no one on from Friday to Saturday or Saturday to Sunday or Sunday to Monday has passed away from COVID-19. We know that someone uh, uh, had passed away in our Friday report. We want to pass on uh, our condolences to that family, to the 168 people, uh, their families who have passed away from COVID-19 uh, over, over the previous months. Uh, it's a difficult time for it. We all know that. It's especially of concern for people who are in long-term care, who are dealing with the very difficult circumstances of not being able to often see their loved ones. So we want to make sure that everyone understands as in this moment of difficulty, in this moment of grief, that we are thinking very co closely of all of them. Over the weekend, there were 36 cases over, th over three days, over three periods, 14, 16, and six, as Dr. Henry has noted. And uh, we see in hospital, there are 13 people, uh, seven in Fraser Health, five in Vancouver Coastal Health, and one in Interior Health. Uh, currently in hospital, and that is a relatively low number compared to what we saw in April, especially. And so that is something that we're continuing to do and for in critical care. In our hospitals, we're seeing, again, a continuing uh, increase overall in the number of people and the utilization rate to the occupancy rate of hospitals. This is as a result of the many surgeries that have started over the last number of weeks, as we reported uh, last Thursday. Uh, just over 5,900 surgeries have taken place the previous week, which is really under these circumstances and uh, an extraordinary success for the healthcare system. So I wanted to note um, finally that we see all around us the challenge that we face here in BC, and it's very, very important to remain uh, humble and to remain vigilant. Washington State over the last couple of weeks has seen an increase, now plateauing, but a plateauing at a higher level. Oregon continues to see significant increases. California, Nevada, Arizona, all of those states that are connected with British Columbia in some ways. There are places people from British Columbia in the past have frequently gone and have close connections to our province. Alaska has seen significant increases. And of course, Alberta yesterday saw its highest case count since May the 16th. So these circumstances are around us, and it's not. Uh, because people aren't striving to do well in those jurisdictions. COVID-19 is a difficult adversary. This week, we mark one month since we started our social, surgical, and economic renewal, and we'll complete the second incubation period since the easing of restrictions began on May 19th this week. A heightened focus on the future can sometimes come at the expense of the actions people take in the moment. People can forget the sacrifices they made and why and they forget the actions they must continue to take to stop the spread or prevent a resurgence. Our BC experience with the, with the easing of restrictions has been uniquely ours. We're building our future and we are achieving it because we have not forgotten where we were or are in our BC pand pandemic. We have not let the easing of restrictions allow us to think we can ease up on the skills we've been taught to stop the spread and keep us safe. We have not let the easing of restrictions allow us to think that the hard work is behind us because it most certainly is not. In BC, we know that COVID-19 deserves respect. We know that COVID-19 looks for inconsistency in our effort to stop the spread. We know that COVID-19 seizes upon the most momentary weakness in our defense, again, to strengthen its grip. Tomorrow, we'll update on the PPE supplies so essential to keeping our healthcare workers and patients safe. On Thursday, we'll update on our transition to single site staffing, so crucial to keeping residents, patients, and their care providers safe. And we'll update our progress on the surgical renewal commitment, so vital to getting patients the surgeries they need. Essential, crucial, vital. These, works, uh, these words speak to the importance of each of us staying 100% all in on our BC COVID-19 response. Essential, crucial, vital. These words speak to our responsibility, all of our responsibilities to stop the spread. These words speak to our individual and collective duty to be consistent in our effort each and every moment of each and every day in phase two and beyond. Je veux dire quelques mots en français. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle du 12, de, des 12 à 13 juin, celle des 13 euh, et 14 juin et celle du 14 jusqu'au 15 juin en mi-journée.
Il n'y a eu aucun des nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces trois périodes de référence, pour un total de 168 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous continuons euh, à offrir nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. À ce jour, 2395 personnes dont les tests, les tests de dépistage de COVID-19 étaient positifs sont maintenant rétablis. Pour la première période de référence, qui s'étend jusqu'au 13 juin, nous avons eu 14 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, qui s'étend jusqu'au 14 juin, nous avons eu 16 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, 24 heures 6 nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés. Cela représente 36 nouveaux cas depuis notre dernière mise à, mise à jour vendredi pour un total de 2745 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Parmi l'ensemble des cas conf confirmés de COVID-19, 13 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 5, euh, dont 4 en soins intensifs. Les autres personnes dont le test de dépistage a été positif sont en isolement à leur domicile. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question only. I would also ask that you please unmute your phones. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, Minister Dix mentioned we're a number of weeks into the incubation periods based on reopening. We're now one full period in after the opening of schools two weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Henry, have we seen any Uh, examples of COVID-19 linked to schools and, and how have you thought that rollout has gone? And on another point you made earlier around rapid spread, we're hearing that some uh, places typically known as nightclubs in Nanaimo are reopening. Does that concern you when they're grappling with issues around things like socially distanced dancing or dancing around their tables potentially in a bubble? Yeah, um, yeah. so schools, I think, you know what? Um, uh, We knew that it was going to be a challenging thing, but the schools have gone really well. Um, I've been really pleased with the reports I've heard. It's not been perfect by any means, and we're figuring it out. Um, but I've had lots of really cool notes from happy children who've gone back and at least been able to see their friends. And I think the measured way that we've done it um, so it has made it easier uh, for everybody to learn how to adapt. And we've learned that, uh, as we did with the restaurants uh, orders and, and guidelines we had in place, that some things are just not workable and you need to, to find a better way to do them. So I think it's been really helpful for that. Um, and it takes that sort of fear sense away, um, both for the, the staff, the educators, and the children, um, that a school environment can be safe. And we have had no cases associated with schools yet in the province. It could happen, but so far everything has been uh, really great that way. Um, and you know, it's, it's going well. And I think we're learning some really important things that will help us prepare uh, through the summer and into the fall. And, and that's a very important thing as well. And I am um, actually extremely proud of all of the educators and the staff in the school system. There are children who absolutely need it to be back in that in-classroom learning environment. And this has been incre incredibly important for them. So that's, um, uh, that's what we're, where we are with the schools right now. And I think it's going as well as it could be expected. Um, The, in terms of nightclubs, yeah, so nightclubs themselves are not open. Um, they are still uh, closed, but some have been looking at repurposing um, to meet the, uh, the, the, the guidance that we have for restaurants and events. So it would have to be small numbers, um, certainly maximum 50, depending on the size of the space, with, social, with uh, physical distancing and with all the barriers and important things that need to be in place. And I know their uh, WorkSafe BC is working through some of the guidance, and that was some of the clarifications uh, that were in uh, the orders for restaurants that we put out last week. So um, it is going to be challenging because we know there are some things like um, dance floors that are not going to happen right now. Um, as well as we know uh, that um, singing um, and singing in a group can be a very dangerous thing uh, for this virus. 
Um, and we've seen that in a number of places around the world, um, including uh, recent uh, examples in, uh, in the states to the south of us where um, singing groups in churches, even with physical distancing, have led to, to transmission of cases and singing in other situations as well. So those are all things that we'll need to work through. And I know WorkSafe is working with the industry to, to come up with some reasonable guidance for that. Next question is from Ethan Sawyer, CBC. Hi there. Um, my question is relating to uh, the outbreak at Holy Family Facility in Vancouver. Uh, given all the controls around long-term care facilities in BC, how do you think these outbreaks keep happening? Uh, has Holy Family completed its single-site staffing plan? And can you confirm that this outbreak happened in a dementia wing? Uh, I'm not aware that it's in a dementia wing, but I'm not uh, entirely sure on that. Um, as far as I'm aware, they have completed their single site. But, you know, this is the challenge with this virus, that we learn from it every time one of these things happens. Um, we have done the best to reduce the, the, the concentration of people in long-term care homes, and, and that has um, some of the challenges that go with that. As well, we know that uh, um, wearing PPE, so wearing masks um, when we're providing care and long-term care is an important piece. But this virus, um, some people can have very mild symptoms or may not recognize the symptoms that they have. And there are moments where we um, are uh, off our guard, perhaps, where we can spread it. And so I know the investigation continues and that when we first um, uh, have detected outbreaks in long-term care homes. Sometimes we're, we're, we get it early enough that it's only a staff person, um, but unfortunately in this case it's become apparent that there have been a number of residents and uh, we know that as well as other staff who have been affected as well. Um, Right now, the investigation continues. We're making sure that everybody is being assessed. I know that this is a, a long-term care and a, a so assisted living facility that are closely connected. As far as I'm aware, it's only the long-term care part that's affected at the moment. This, you know, this really um, tells us that you know, the challenges are that we know that it's staff that are in and out of the facilities right now. Um, our concern, of course, is if we have more people coming into the facility, our ability to to detect and care for people um, goes down. And so it, it's a very challenging time. Um, and we're, you know, this outbreak reminds us of how uh, quickly it can spread in that environment, even with reduced people, with the, the measures that we know are in place. Next question is from Vaughn Palmer, Vancouver Sun. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking the question. Um, uh, would be, uh, could we hear uh, your assessment of this uh, controversy that's emerged in the United Kingdom over the study in the Lancet, where some people have interpreted it to mean that one meter separation might be good enough. You might not have to stick to two meters on physical distancing. Um, where do you stand on that issue, please? Yeah, it, that's you know this is something that w w we <laughs> we've parsed out for many years. This is not a new discussion. Um, when we talk about droplet spread in general, we're talking about somewhere around one to two meters. So uh, we have always well for this virus because we know that there's very limited things we can do once somebody has been exposed. There's no treatment. There's no vaccine. We tend to be more on the cautious side. So technically, we say droplet spread is within a meter, but uh, we have, and I think the consensus in most of my colleagues for uh, around the world for um, these types of settings is to say two meters is what we need to do, particularly in healthcare settings. Um, so two meters is safe. We know that it works. There's lots of, of not lots, but there is now increasing evidence that those uh, physical distancing measures that we have put in place in many places around the world have saved tens of thousands of lives. So what we're looking at and what the UK, the Lancet article was, was trying to say is in those places that you're probably still at lower risk if you're at least a meter 
but they also say that you need another layer of protection if you're within that period, uh, within that space as well. And that's where um, wearing uh, cloth masks or non-medical masks when you need to be within the meter or, uh, you know, within the one to two meter <laughs> range um, needs to be layered on. So um, I think that's a way of helping to um, make things a bit more reasonable in some situations, for example, on transit, where we know that adding that extra layer of wearing a, a non-medical mask can facilitate and keep you safer. Um, but I think uh, our, our way of approaching this and the way that we've been most of the uh, countries around the world is, is that safest is at least two meters. Where were written, Tai Yi. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, thank you for this briefing. Uh, last month, a couple at the end of April, you said that you were looking into how to report disaggregated race-based data on who is being infected and who is dying from COVID. Um, you know, just last uh, at the end of May, another organization joined the call for this data. Could you update us on where in the process you are and when British Columbians can expect to see the information? Yeah, so I think I mentioned this last week that uh, uh, we have not been collecting it systematically for cases um, right now, but part of the way that we're looking at it is geographically, which helps us understand a little bit, as well as um, the surveys that we've done and the work that we're doing on the unintended consequences, um, both positive and negative, have been disaggregated and will be um, presented um, using such things as race-based uh, data, as well as geographic, socioeconomic status, the other things that we know uh, go into uh, helping us understand who has been most differentially affected. So the survey, as you know, um, ended uh, a few weeks ago now, at the end of May, um, and we've started to get some preliminary results. We were just talking about this on Friday. Um, so we will be presenting that as soon as we get some results that are able to, uh, uh, that we can share when the analysis has been done. As you can imagine, with 370 some records, it takes some time for the data to be uh, cleaned and to be put in a place that uh, we can get some uh, results out of it. But that's something we've committed to do as soon as we can. Same with the unintended consequences. There are many indicators that we've now prioritized, and we are going to get those out as soon as we can by as much of disaggregation as we can. So those will be coming in the coming weeks. Fender Sudgeon, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, in your remarks, you talked about transitioning to phase three and talked about traveling safely. And I just want to confirm, is that something that you're saying British Columbians can do now? And if not, do you anticipate um, easing some of those travel restrictions within BC this week? Yeah, so we have been looking at the numbers, as we've said, and so the second incubation period comes up very soon, um, and those are the transitions. So it's not going to be a full-on, full-off. It's, it's as we said, the dimmer switch. So yes, we uh, will be looking at um, transitioning around travel, around um, safe travel within BC, and certainly, uh, you know, that's what we've been saying uh, for this summer. We want people to be uh, to experience BC, to stay home, to st to travel within BC, but to do it in a way that doesn't put undue burden on the place that you're going, and to make sure you take those things like calling ahead, finding out what's open, finding out um, being as self-sufficient as you can when you're going to some of the smaller communities, as well as um, you know, ensuring the ferries and also being very um, respectful of many communities who may not be ready to have a lot of guests yet um, and uh, following their advice as well. Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and uh, Minister Dix. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I want to ask you today about what your response is to people that we've been talking to who are following all of your public safety orders, but they're watching others flagrantly violating them by gathering in large crowds to demonstrate. And they're concerned that the longer this virus is spreading, the harder it's going to be for them to stay in business, as well as reports of American tourists cheating their way into BC, uh, pretending that they're here on their way to Alaska, but they're actually just vacationing. Yeah, you know, I think from the very beginning, our, our approach 
has been that we need to uh, we need to be tolerant, we need to be kind, we need to understand that we don't necessarily know everybody's story. Um, I have come out, as you know, with uh, with recommendations around demonstrations. It's very important that we put our voices out there for um, things like anti-racism and have our voices heard because it is an incredibly important issue, even in the middle of a pandemic. But there's ways to do that safely. Um, we have seen people who have been very effective at doing that in a safe way. And that is what I encourage. Small numbers, you can be very impactful with many small numbers. Um, you can keep your distance, you can wear masks. So those are things that um, we have to find that balance. Um, when it comes to people cheating, if you will, we know that th those are border issues and that there are penalties for doing that. Um, those are things that, uh, that people need to be aware of, and I know Minister Dix can talk to that as well. Um, but I think we need to be cautious about the stories that we hear because we may not always know the full story. Well, just to say at the border, Marcella, I think uh, we can look at it pretty much at the, at the Canada-US border. If people are uh, misleading people at the border, then there will there there can very likely be consequences for that, and I would advise anyone even contemplating such a thing to give their head a shake and not do it, uh, because it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense, and they put at risk um, in, in some respects their ability to uh, to visit our country uh, in the future. So uh, that's a federal government issue, but uh, and there may be a few people, as you say, uh, cheating in that way. But I, I, I suspect, uh, I suspect uh, not many. And if they do so, they perhaps don't fully understand the risks they take in misleading people about that information as they cross uh, the international border. With respect to um, following the rules, I think what I, what I say to people is, first of all, there are enormous opportunities, I think, to express our opinion in the democracy. Uh, there's very large online meetings that take place uh, every day now. Many of us are part of those. An opportunity to influence discussion and debate is significant. So we have to try and find alternate means. And to understand that from a, uh, a value point of view, that many people uh, are not able right now, for example, to go to, uh, f to, go to memorial services and celebrations of life and funerals uh, right now because of the limits on the size of crowds. And that is a loss because all of us would say that comforting and being part of that experience is important and yet people aren't doing it right now. And that's true of many other social gatherings of importance to people. So I, I really would advise people to, to consider that and to consider, as we have consistently said, the fact that it is, it is those that are most vulnerable in terms of their health that are most vulnerable to COVID-19 and its consequences. And the people that you're most likely to affect negatively are people in those circumstances that you know and that you love. And that we, it's very important that we keep that in context. We are, the physical distancing saves lives and we're gonna have to continue to do it for days and weeks and months to come. Which means we're going to have to adjust to that continue to participate in our society and the economy and all the things we need to participate in while following those rules because they're in our interest to do so. And, we need to, and, and because those that we will affect negatively are the ones that we care about the most. Jane Side, North Shore News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, I have a question that touches on the uh, long-term care um, and also a little bit about uh, the border issues. Um, I think that you have sort of hinted on a couple of occasions that it was likely the Washington state uh, strain of the virus that first made it into the uh, long-term care homes, um, including the ones on the North Shore. So one of my questions is, I'm, I'm curious um, if you can tell us anything at this point, a couple months after that happened, um, how that came to be, whether it was a healthcare worker who was on vacation or who had had contact with a family member or a gathering. I'm just curious to know how that actually happened. Um, and on a similar uh, similar vein, um, 
there there are a lot of uh, restrictions on uh, visitors, and yet it seems to be that uh, it's staff members who are um, bringing this into the care homes because nobody else is really going in or out at this point. And so I'm curious about what kind of monitoring of the healthcare workers is happening going forward. And do you count on self-reporting or what happens if somebody says they're fine, um, but they don't appear to be fine? I'm just hoping for a little bit more clarity on that. Yeah, so uh, we we knew that uh, it this virus is passed between people. And yes, there was healthcare workers who went to Washington State. There was also um, people who got it from family members who traveled back and forth. There was um, people from Washington State who came here and passed it on to people. We were at a period of time, so it's very hard to know exactly uh, how it was transmitted in each specific case and who the index case might have been um, at that very early phase. But yes, most of the outbreaks in long-term care have been from healthcare workers bringing it into the facility. And that, you know, speaks to the fact that, as you mentioned, they are the only ones in the facility at the moment. Um, and we do not know how many um, outbreaks might have been averted because others were not coming in and out of the facility as they did prior to uh, prior to us having these outbreak uh, responses. So it is very challenging to know. We can't prove what um, what didn't happen, um, but that is one of the considerations that we have. We know the the community in a, a long term care home is very vulnerable to this type of this virus, and that it's very challenging um, when you have people coming in and out, and and when you have many other people. Even though I may be there for my loved one, um, the the person in the room next door. Um, their family member wants to come in for their loved one, and we dramatically increase the number of people who are coming in and out of the facility. And when you have community transmission, that risk goes up quite a lot for that individual facility. So finding that balance of how to keep everybody in that community safe is very challenging. Um, and we been finding it increasingly challenging as we learn more about how this virus can be spread uh, from people who have minimal symptoms who may not recognize it in themselves. So yes, the orders that we have across the province are to have active screening, which means people have to um, go through a screening process when they come into the facility every day. It is done a little bit differently in different facilities, but those are the things that every time we have an outbreak, we learn a bit more about. Um, but it should be um, somebody uh, asking the question of the people individually. And there is a process, there should be a process in every facility for if somebody's not feeling well, um, who excludes them from work that day. Uh, we also know that it's very challenging because we don't, um, we, we know that in many situations, in many of the outbreaks that I've talked about, um, we bring it in to our people that we're closest with, people that we spend the most time with, and most often that's our family and our loved ones. And uh, nobody intends to do that, um, and it's a measure of how this virus can be spread. And once it's into a facility or a family or a group, um, it can be spread very rapidly before we can get an understanding of what's going on, and we call it the force of infection. So in some settings, if we don't catch it early enough, if enough people are shedding virus, um, that's where things like uh, touching surfaces and, and not cleaning your hands become really important because the more virus that's in that environment, and we've seen that in, in um, places around the world where it seems like it's spreading just widely through the air when really if there's quite a few people in a uh, particularly in an enclosed environment who have even mild symptoms, the amount of virus in, in the environment becomes greater and that means it's easier for us to pick it up and to transfer it to each other. We also know in healthcare that uh, wearing of PPE, which is the last resort, we try and do other things um, to protect people, but putting it on and taking it off are, are times when we 
um, can self-contaminate or we can contaminate others um, inadvertently. So those are all scenarios. We also know that uh, in many settings, and I talked about this a little bit, you know, in our workplace settings, whether it's a healthcare setting, whether it's a restaurant or a grocery store, we sometimes let our guard down when we're talking with each other, when uh, healthcare workers get together or when the people in the grocery store, the, your employees get together before on break time or at lunch time or um, carpool together to work. And we've seen those being settings where we can transfer this virus between each other inadvertently. So there's no simple answer to it, and it's it's what we've been learning is that you know the transmissibility and the capriciousness of this virus makes it very challenging for us, particularly in some of these communal settings uh, where we have uh, we have closer contact with people. Next question is from Lisa Cordesco, CHLY. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Um, immediate family members are now being allowed to cross uh, from Washington State into D.C. to um, be with their families. And, uh, of course, they're required to quarantine for 14 days when they do come into D.C. Um, but for quite a while now, people from both sides of the border have been connecting in Peace Arch Park um, for the day, and there's no quarantine required of them. And, you know, some people are wondering, you know, a person from D.C. could easily be infected or infect others in that situation uh, and bring it into their communities. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of square that circle for us. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've talked about this before as well. And, you know, it depends, uh, of course, if that is your circle and that person is the one person that you're having contact with, that you need to be cautious, of course, that you don't, um, that preferably you do it with distancing. Um, but yes, we're not having somebody come into our environment for extended period of time. And so anybody who is in that environment, who is meeting with somebody, needs to be very cautious about their own symptoms and needs to, to check and make sure every day that they are feeling well before they go out into the environment. So it would be the same if somebody came across and was in quarantine. Um, as a contact of a contact, somebody in quarantine, I would just still need to monitor myself carefully for symptoms, but I could, I was not in quarantine myself. So it's not like everybody in the whole household needs to be in quarantine if somebody comes to visit. Keith Baldry, Global News. Thank you, Dr. Henry, Minister Dix, for taking my question. There's an Angus Reid poll out today that suggests while a majority of Canadians are still following public health guidelines, the number of them doing that has dropped from uh, similar polls back in April. How concerned are you that people may be becoming complacent because while, as you point out, COVID-19 is raging around the world and across the border, it's not at the same numbers in Canada. Is there a sense of complacency setting in? And also just in um, Binder's question earlier, are we going to get to phase three this week? Because this is going to, when the two incubation periods are up, I believe, on by Tuesday. Um, so I'll answer the second one. Um, maybe uh, you know we're continuing to watch, looking at the numbers, but you know it's it's a it's not a um, yes we're in phase three. It's 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 a gradual increasing of the things that we're doing. So uh, I think I've said at the very beginning that the whole phase thing is it's it's more of a dimmer switch so it's not a hard and fast and now we can so i don't want to give people the impression that what we're saying is if we go to phase phase three that suddenly we don't have to do the same things that we need to do and and that speaks to the concern about complacency saying that we're in phase three does not mean that we have license to to stop our, our physical distancing. It doesn't mean that we're stopping our hand washing and covering our cough and staying home with we're ill. It does not mean in any way, and I've said this a number of times, that gatherings can increase and that more people. What it does mean is that we are working on the guidance with more slowly, thoughtfully, um, more businesses being able to open. Um, you know, we've been through this in a transition so that not everything is happening at once. And now we are um, approaching the place where I believe we will be moving into uh, the transition where we can start planning our summer vacations here in BC. But again, doing it within the, the, the bounds of the, the gatherings uh, restrictions, within the bounds of, of making sure we have our physical distancing, doing it in a way that uh, um, protects the communities that we're going to visit. Next question is from Laura Brom, CFEX. 
Hi. So I was um, so last week there were some care homes that had announced they were allowing uh, visits with the residents to resume, and then uh, I know one home in Victoria had announced that, and then stepped it back, saying, "Oh, actually, we uh, can't under the rules." So I was wondering if you have a message for any care homes that are looking at allowing visits when the restrictions haven't lifted yet. Yeah, so I think there was some confusion, and and it's it's challenging. Um, we had put in um, increased language and defi definitions of what essential visitors were. So those were in place from the beginning, but the interpretation in different places and different homes in particular, um, some healthcare facilities um, was was slightly different. So it's trying to get everybody to the same. Um, the same approach, and we are, as I've mentioned, working with the, the sector on making sure that um, when the time is right, that everybody has the guidance they need to have uh, visits resume in a safe way. I think the challenge we face, and I've been saying that a few times today, is as we open up society more and we see more businesses and schools and other things open, we do run the risk, and we have seen this, of increasing transmission. And we need to be really on top of it. And so uh, we have to accept that if the more people that we allow into long-term care homes, the risk again goes up that somebody will inadvertently introduce the virus into that care setting. So we're all struggling with that, um, both the, the owners and operators, the healthcare workers, families, and residents themselves, many of whom send me notes, which is really heartening. And I, I have to say, I am, I am incredibly heartened by the resiliency of, of uh, our seniors and elders. But it is, it is the most challenging question that we have, because you know, it's a balancing of, of quality of life all around, and it's not a simple question. So we... Oh. Just to add very briefly to that, that all of these questions, and it's true in acute care as well as long-term care, where we would, I think many of us would normally visit uh, uh, a loved one who's staying overnight in the hospital. It's, uh, it's why it's so important for everyone to reflect, whatever phase we're in, of the need to maintain physical distancing, of the need to stopping the spread, because issues such as this one, the difficult things that we're working through to, to at some point allow visits, depend on our, our collective willingness uh, to continue to act, uh, to continue to physically distance, to continue to wash our hands, to continue to do all the things that Dr. Henry has advised. So th this, is a, this is critically important. We have to think about the people most at risk and the people who most need uh, social support and, inter and, uh, and interaction. And when we act to physically distance, when we act to wash our hands, when we act um, to follow the rules, uh, we're making all of that more possible. And when we don't, we are making it less possible. So during this time when we're seeing an opening up, it is even more important to follow the rules that exist. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later today. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the Provincial Health Officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Dan Burrett, CBC. Dr. Henry, we are hearing about a South Asian wedding that may be at the center of another outbreak. Lots of videos going around social media showing people dancing close together. Wondering if you can share any information on that and that if uh, weddings and events of up to 50 people, no more, as you said, are going forward beyond the hand washing and wearing masks, et cetera, what other specific things do people need to do? Individual meal portions, no dancing, uh, separate drinks for everybody, like no sharing of, of, of containers, et cetera. And if the minister can respond en français, merci. Sure. Um, I can't 
speak to that specific incident you're talking about or a party you're talking about because I'm not aware of that. But I will say that, yeah, we know that, uh, and, and this is I actually spent much of my weekend looking at some of this, is you know where, where do we get transmission around the world? Where are the settings that are most at risk? And what, what are the things that we can do to try and prevent those from seeding our community in an ongoing way? And uh, the, we know that there are unfortunately things that we really enjoy, things like choirs and uh, religious services and funerals and celebrations like weddings and um, all those important birthday celebrations. There are also places like nightclubs where people are getting together in enclosed environments. So we know some things are riskier than others. We know it's riskier when you're indoors in an enclosed space with poor ventilation with lots of people. So what we're trying to find is a way to allow us to have these important life celebrations in a way that's not going to put those we love the most at risk, um, or even the ones we're closest to. Um, so those are, those are the balance that we have to find. And we're using 50. We've been consistent from the beginning that it's maximum of 50. And that's a number that we know if somebody inadvertently brings it into that number of people, we can probably find them relatively quickly. We can help control it and stop the spread. And it's not going to um, take off exponentially. We're not going to get hundreds of people. So yes, there's things that you can do if you have it, if you're planning an event, you want to make sure that you have the ability to have physical space between people so that um, family units can be together, but you have the ability to, um, to separate out from others. You want to make it really easy for people who are more, more likely to have severe illness, to get very sick or to die from this, to attend in a virtual way so that you're not putting them at risk by being around a lot of other people. Um, you want to make sure that, yeah, if you're doing dancing, you need to do it with your own small group and then have small groups that are physically separated so that you can enjoy this. And, you know, outdoors is better than indoors. Big spaces are, give you more leeway than smaller spaces. We're becoming increasingly aware that things like singing are, are challenging because somebody who has a very mild case or maybe just before they become um, symptomatic, if they, they can expel a lot of droplets with singing. And there's no way that indoors you can have a choir practice that would allow enough distance that, that would not put people at risk. And we've seen many situations where that has arisen, including very recently in, in Oregon um, with a, a, a church service. So those are things that are important. There is guidance around this, um, but as you say, no buffets because we know that's a place that um, we can mix and mingle virus. <laughs> um, no, um, so single servings for people, doing it in a way that um, allows people to, to maintain that safe distance, both the staff, or if there's staff who are working at an event and uh, the people who are, are participating or attending as well. So these are all the, the things that we're going to have to work out with each other over the coming months. But this is going to be in place for us, um, at least for the foreseeable future, until we have a, a really good treatment that uh, works for people, or until we have a vaccine, or until the virus mutates and doesn't cause this anymore. But I don't think that's as likely. Cette réponse est un défi. <laughs> <laughs> Mais uh, juste pour dire, I think to say in English, it's really important to understand it's not a limit of 50 people or physical distancing. It's a limit of 50 people and physical distancing. Je pense uh, en français dire que il faut suivre les conseils de Dr. Henry de Dout uh, dans le système de, de santé publique. C'est pas une punition, c'est une nécessité pour qu'on puisse euh, euh, poursuivre no, euh, notre vie euh, dans le nouveau normal euh, de la société. Donc, quand on parle des célébrations, que, que ce soit euh, une célébration d'un anniversaire, une célébration de mariage, quoi que ce soit, il faut suivre les règlements. Ce serait, euh, je pense, désastreux d'avoir un événement qui doit être une, qui doit être une célébration 
et de voir la propagation de COVID-19 dans une famille ou dans un groupe d'amis. Euh, ce serait désastre d'avoir un mariage ou un événement où quelqu'un qui est proche et aimé tombe malade et va à l'hôpital. Il faut suivre les règlements parce que ça, c'est la manière dont on peut continuer dans un contexte où on a un virus sans vaccin. Et euh, donc, euh, ce n'est pas une punition, c'est une opportunité. Ces règlements, en fin de compte, euh, ouvrent la voie de la participation dans la société. Mais c'est nécessaire de les suivre, de les suivre, de les suivre chaque fois limiter euh, des événements et, euh, à 50 bien entendu, mais aussi de suivre des autres règlements qui vont nous, nous euh, rendre euh, 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 sains et sauves et qui, qui va protéger aussi et surtout euh, ce que, que nous, avons, nous aimons. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.